Marshawn Sager here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Everyone, welcome to the season premiere of The Realignment. Thanks for giving us a week off. We've increased the amount of episodes we do, so definitely getting that break was huge. Quick shout out before we start this episode. We launched the Supercast last season, and it's been the thing that's enabled us to do these discussion episodes, go to three episodes a week, start putting out more bonus content, the Q&As you all love, all that great stuff. So if you could go to realignment.supercast.com and support the show, five a month, 50 a year, 500 for a lifetime membership, we would really, really, really appreciate it. We're going into the 2024 election period, so the show is going to get bigger and better than ever, and this is the way we do it. Sagar, any quick things you want to add to that? No, just as a reminder, video production is expensive. Uh, in general, production is very expensive. Marshall needs to rent some studio space in Austin for guests and all that. It costs just a hell of a lot of money. So anything that you guys can chip in deeply helps out the show. And if you like it, then I think you should support it. I just recently checked and I have 15 different sub stacks and Patreons that I personally subscribe to. Not saying that you have to be that person, but uh, I think it's important uh, to help each other out in this in this economy. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's funny. I've... Uh felt the urge to actually support people more now that I've actually done yeah. this myself because you know I have the benefit of the realignment effect we being like our side thing. I want this to be my full-time thing by this time next year, but there are a lot of folks who are actually doing this full-time. And I told this to you that first week that we started this, I'm like, I do not know how people like you have this be your entire thing. Like it's really yeah, great it's stressful. getting that <laughs> yeah. W2 paycheck that yeah. always shows up and cancellations and churn, all those things. So once again, don't just support the realignment at realignment.supercast.com. If there's anyone who you're into, definitely go support them as well Mm -hmm. too. All right, into this opening discussion episode. So a couple of topics we're going to hit today. So first one would be Andrew Yang's announcement of forward transitioning from a PAC, a political action committee, to transitioning into an actual third political party by means of merging with two other center left and center right groups. Andrew's a friend. He's been on the show. His campaign manager has been on the show. So we're obviously huge fans of him interpersonally. Sagar, any opening thoughts on this topic? I know people are going to be thinking about it. I got no beef with Andrew Yang. I think my problem is not actually him. It's actually a lot of the other people who are involved. So for example, like Christine Todd Whitman and others. And The issue is that for this to be legitimately like a third party network, you would need credibility with actual Republicans in order to make this uh, into a thing. Right now, most of the people who are involved are just coded Democrat. And so I think that, again, this is not a critique of the project. It's like cynical. It's more, I want it to be effective if we're actually going to do it. And I just don't see anybody who's legitimately involved right now who could actually get some real crossover votes with like a MAGA type Republican. And also in general, I'm just not sure that focusing purely on structural reform is the right way to go forward. I actually just don't think any of this has to do with ranked choice. I'm not saying that ranked choice voting wouldn't help, by the way. I'm actually kind of in favor of ranked choice voting. Um, More just that structural reform itself is not necessarily the ground that I would stake in the beginning. And we've just talked a lot here about on the show. I think politics is about vibes. And like, if I were to start a quote unquote third party, it would just be about having a different vibe and actually forward captures that vibe well, but in terms of its actual execution, I haven't been able to see that yet. What do you think? Yeah. Lots of great commentary here. Quick thing. This is so much easier when we've had a break. Just to yeah. like comment, my thoughts are clearer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could hear what you're saying. My urge to interrupt is just gone because mm-hmm. I'm like, what's Sagar vibe? What's Sagar give his answer? And you don't have to get overly excited. Okay. So several things here that I want to say. I really like your point about what type of Republicans would have to actually be here. So for people who don't know, Christy Todd Whitman uh, is one Republican, former Republican, and then David Jolly, a former representative from Florida, is the other Republican. Christine Todd Whitman was a Republican governor of New Jersey in the late 1990s, and then she was the EPA, Environmental Protection Administrator, under the George W. Bush administration 
obviously she had a bit of an awkward time there considering the fact that she was very like, let's take action on climate change. Once again, she's conservative, but like, let's take action on climate change. And obviously the Bush administration was pulling out of the Kyoto Protocol, obviously, and having you know someone like Dick Cheney be the vice president, there wasn't a strong fit there. So she's always had an awkward presence in the post 2000s Republican Party. So you just said, Sagar, that you'd want something that would appeal to MAGA people. I actually disagree with that because with something like this, it's not MAGA people are actually are pretty well served by the current Republican Party. If you're a MAGA person, you're good to go. Like you're, you're not, you're, you're, you're the status quo makes a lot of sense to you. You're winning all of the big debates. The politicians that were not Trump, Ron DeSantis, Elise Stefanik, Kevin McCarthy are moving in Trump's direction. So you're actually very well served by the current political system. The group of people that Andrew and them are trying to get to, once again, country club, center right Republicans, that is a group that is very not well served by the current moment. They're current, they're they're saying, hey, like we don't like Trump, but we also think the Democratic Party is run by AOC. Now, I know there are plenty of people who on the left will listen to the show and they'll say, like, what do you mean the Democratic Party? It's not run by AOC. That's not how politics actually works. Like I've spoken to lots of these people. Sorry, you've spoken to these people. There just are a lot of people in that category. So the question is, if you're trying to get those people, if you're trying to take them away from the Democratic Party, because some Democrats are trying to basically get people like them, and then if you're trying to say MAGA Republicans are too crazy, you should be trying to bring them into your forward party. But that would mean you have to actually select politicians who I think have proven they could walk this tightrope. So we can dunk on Larry Hogan all we want, but Larry Hogan is an example of a mm. Republican politician who actually appeals to center left Democrats, center right Republicans, and wins in a blue state like Maryland. Charlie Baker, once again, both these two governors are retiring, so it says something about the current political system, but Charlie Baker, successful governor of Massachusetts. There's actually a bunch of other Northeastern Republicans, like the governor of Vermont, who've been successful. Vermont. Exactly, yeah. who've been successful. Those are the Republican or directionally Republican politicians that forward would need to actually get in not retreads from the 2000s. And the fact that those politicians aren't a part of this, maybe they're going to join, but I'd be a lot more intrigued by this if they had said, Larry Hogan, Charlie Baker, you're on your way out, but will you guys switch to our party when we announce this big thing? That would have been much more impressive to me because I want to see people who can actually win under the thesis you guys are putting forth under that bit. Okay, so second bits here. I want to actually go through this because, Sagar, you were talking about structural change not really being the center of everything. Here are the specific structural changes that the forward people want to put forward. I want to reflect on them with you. So mm -hmm. basically, they wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post announcing this movement. We will link this in the show notes. But they've said, quote unquote, the purpose of forward is to break down barriers between voters an increased political choice. Like this is their central thesis. And basically, if I can understand your comment about the vibe, they are alleging that the central vibe of American politics right now is that people don't like these two choices. Mm -hmm. We'll get into that in a second, but here are what they are putting forth to actually make those changes. Number one, ranked choice voting. Number two, open primaries. Number three, ending gerrymandering. And number four, nationwide protection of voting rights. Let's just go down the list, like ranked choice voting. Like what's your, what, what is ranked choice voting and what's your perspective on it? Ranked choice voting is whenever you're voting for someone, you would rank them in the order that you like them. And then whenever they run the tabulations, they go and they see whoever is first, then second, then third. If the first person doesn't have enough votes in order to get to a 50%, then they would go to the second point, uh, person and they would do that all the way down the line across each ballot until one person reaches 50. The reason it matters is actually we saw this in what, was New York City mayoral primary yeah. with Andrew Yang, uh, where well, it didn't necessarily work out for him, but it did actually change the way that the votes were tabulated at the beginning and kind of threw a wrench into the system. I think it's cool because it's about general preference and not just a single person that you're voting for. And I again think that you're correct. I, I do want to revise my statement. I'm not entirely sure why I said MAGA Republican. More what I was getting at, uh, getting at, at was it has to have legitimate crossover appeal. Mm -hmm. And so there are only really two disaffected large groups of voters in America today, non-voters and then people who are Biden Republicans who 
voted for Biden and didn't like Trump. Progressives, yes, I know you exist, but to be honest, you mostly fall into the non-voter category because most of you didn't vote. Just statistically, I'm saying uh, whenever you're younger. So I'm talking again, there's non-voters and then there's the Biden Republicans who have legitimately switched votes and are very much up for grabs, the Glenn Youngkin type voter. So yeah, you're right. That's who he needs to switch over to. And that's my problem with ranked choice is the, it's like those people don't care about ranked choice voting. They don't care about it at all. They do agree with Visa's statement about, I don't like these two choices, uh, but ranked choice in voting is not what's getting them going. And the thing too here is I don't have an objection to ranked choice voting. No, I, I have none. Yeah. I, like I said, I actually think it would help, but sure. You know, yeah. like sure, New York City, sure, California, but just looking at the current political moment right now, I don't see that change moving the dial that mm -hmm. much. So, I also need to be frank here. Those changes are not the type of thing that I actually no, but let me, actually let me put it this way, dude. Like, and this is what what my central beef really is. Ranked choice voting has passed. It's passed in Democratic states. It's passed in New York. Yeah. It's passed in California. This change does not require a new party. Well, I that's think that's basically that's, what it comes. That's down a good to. example, right? Which is that it's a Democratic policy, and also, frankly, the reason that one party states like New York and California want it is it actually makes the Republican way less competitive, right? Explain, <laughs> explain that. Yeah. Well, because it's like, well, most people in these states are Democrats and then their general choice is going to be like far left, centrist, semi-centrist, far right Democrat with the D next to their name. So it actually, frankly, only really helps the party in power in a one party state. If anything, it's a guarantor of one party state rule. And that's where it really, really, really gets you because once again, third parties have been successful. We've talked about this a lot, but this is the five, which is fascinating. Third parties, other than the Republican Party in the 1850s, but that's because the Whig Party literally mm -hmm. collapsed. And we're not, and by the way, when we say collapse, we don't just mean narrative collapse. So once again, I know it was on the ballot Nancy anymore. Pelosi's yeah. lame. Oh, no one likes the DNC. Republicans in disarray. Like that isn't what like collapse means. Like the the the, the Whig Party literally collapsed and fell apart, and there was a vacuum in the American political system, a vacuum which was filled by the Republican Party. So, mm -hmm. other than that example, third parties have been effective because they have captured aspects of existing political parties because they have noticed to your point of the breakdown of the opening they have noticed hey there's this thing that parties are not filling we are going to run on this campaign we're going to be successful in the sense of making an impact really proving there's a constituency here and then what happens is that politicians who by you know dent of being ambitious craving power they say hey i want to be elected i'm going to take this innovation so william jennings bryan there's a progressive party um, in the you know 1890s. They actually come in and take over the Democratic Party because it turned out that the Democratic Party was vulnerable to a ideological takeover because of the fact that you had the issue of silver and monetary policy and the fact that the country was urbanizing, yet all these rural people in places like Nebraska, where William Jenny Bryan was from, were being left behind. So there was a specific thing there. Once again, Theodore Roosevelt were huge, huge, huge Teddy Roosevelt fans here. He loses his campaign in 1912. But the thing was, the Democratic Party of the time, we could do a whole separate conversation about why Woodrow Wilson is like unironically problematic in the most like capital P problematic sense of the term. But they say, hey, there's a lot of voters who don't like the status quo. We think that pro the progressive movement is the is the real is the real thing. There, we are going to take that energy of the Bull Moose Party and inculcate that into our political party. That then leads to the New Deal process. So, like that is successful. And then finally, Ross Perot. Ross Perot's critique of globalization, his critique of immigration policy, that and then Patrick Buchanan. Obviously, that is picked up by the Republican Party. So that is how actual third parties make an impact because they they capture something. And what, what Sagar and I are not seeing here is we are not seeing a example of we've noticed this gap in the system. And then either we, so if we, if we can't win outright, do we have something that either party is going to pick up? Republicans are just not going to pick up this like change 
um, structural change bit. Like, you know, I did the gerrymandering episode and there were a lot of people on the right in the audience who did not like that episode, just did not buy the critique. Why? What was the criticism? Basically, the criticism is, is just cope. Um, it's basically the, the criticism. I agree with that, by the, 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 critici- yeah. the, the, the criticism was okay, sure. I mean, look, this, this is why it was a kind of frustrating uh, feedback from the audience where it's like no one was defending gerrymandering mm-hmm. on the face of it, but they were basically like, the only reason why this is being talked about is like Rep- Democrats are pissed that Republicans can't win. And when Republicans were out of power, Democrats used this. So this is basically hypocrisy. But EOD, as of most of these Andrew Yang reforms, I don't think there's any case for having legislators set the boundaries, just to be entirely frank. And if the charge is hypocrisy, if the charge is, well, back in the 70s and 80s, Democrats loved gerrymandering when they controlled the House for 40 years. I say, okay, sure, Dems are hypocrites. I'm a podcaster. I don't have to be accountable to either party. I could just say that moving forward, having, I know once again, non- and also they were skeptical of the idea that anything could truly be nonpartisan, which I think is fair. Um, yeah, from I a technocratic that's, perspective, that's yeah. but end of the day, I don't think it makes sense to have legislators set the boundaries just because you can just find extreme examples in both cases. Um, so that's the other one. And then there's also like open primaries. Um, so this would basically mean that like, and in in, in, you don't have to be a registered member of a party to vote in a primary. This one is interesting for me because at a philosophical level, at a practical level, I'm like, sure. It'd be good to have for there to be incentives for people not just to cater to like the most right wing parts of their bases. But out of fill so I'm most like, so if I were in the legislature, I would vote for open primaries. Um, it also aligns well with my like politics. I'm like decently centrist. So like that would probably help me hypothetically. But philosophically, I kind of buy the argument that the members of the parties make when they're like, yo, this party is our club. You might not like our club. People don't like clubs all the time. I'm sure people who are members of the Rotary Club don't like the Elks Club. Mm-hmm. They're like, we're not racially discriminatory. We're not like, you know, we're not violating the Constitution in any way. If we want to say that you have to be a registered member of our party to vote in our primary, that's our constitutional freedom of association right. Guess what? If you want to vote in our primary, register as a Democrat, register as a Republican. If being an independent is so important to you, unregister afterwards. I've registered in both party primaries before. I'm an independent right now, but I've done it and it wasn't that hard. Now, there's an open debate about if this is a hard process. So like in Oregon, where I've been registered to vote, it's super easy. You really just go to a website, Secretary of State's office. It literally takes five minutes. So if a, if a state makes it very hard to switch parties, I can really see that case, but their point is basically like, look, if you want to join our club, join our club. If you're not a member of our club, it's not your right to do this. What do you, what do you, what do you think about like the practical versus the philosophical there? I agree with uh, basically what you just said. I mean, I think a lot of people also just get really, they always, they, they forget exactly what you just said, which is like, yeah, you know, we have freedom of speech. We have a lot of, con- there's a lot of freedom that's just baked into the U S constitution and into our jurisprudence. I also just generally believe that if a critical mass of people want something, it will happen. Now, I don't think that the threshold for that is high enough. Like, I think it should be a lot easier to get that stuff done. But in general, if p- critical mass of people want literally just one thing, then they will gather around it and they will generally kind of make it. I mean, the stock ban is actually a good example, overwhelmingly popular. It's something that we pushed online and hammered for months and probably two years. I think the first time I did a segment on it was about two years ago. And the House Democrats just introduced a position, which is contrary to their own Speaker of the House, saying that they're going to ban stock trading. And, and their financial members, spouses. Right. Because exactly. like, you know people are going to be like, well, the corruption, this is against their financial interest. Yeah. But you saw this, John Ossoff of Georgia put forward that bill initially, mm-hmm. because once again, this is the route the you I, too. About, about you and I like working in politics. Like we actually know politicians. And mm-hmm. I think that's something that a lot of folks don't know about actual politicians is like, yes, like there's greed. Yes, there's like corruption. There's all those different bits. But like actually at a core level, if you are in our political system right now, like your your urge is usually because you want power and you want to be elected. It's it's really not because you're out here hoping you're going to get like handed a check from Lockheed Martin under the table. So if you're John Ossoff, and once again, like I think he probably believes, but he's younger. I think this is definitely like an age thing. There's a reason why the breakdown of people who are opposed to banning, oh, other than to 
Mr. Uh, who's uh, who's our, who's our guy from Texas? Um, uh, Dan one? Crenshaw. Oh, Crenshaw. Dan, yeah. Other than Dan, I, got, I was like, Dan, why, why would you possibly, why would Crenshaw. you possibly oppose that from a pure, like whatever. He wants um, to better himself, Marshall. <laughs> the, the, yeah, that was the, that was the direct quote. But the actual point here is if you're John Ossoff, you could say to yourself, look, under the status quo, like I could hypothetically, once again, legally, but hypothetically, maybe skirt the line of this stuff. Instead, he's a young 30 something and he says, wow, this is popular. Wow. When Sagar does a segment on this, because I know he and his staff, they're like, wow. He actually follows me on Twitter. He's followed me for like two years. See, this this is, this is, this is my thing. They know how this works. So Mm -hmm. that is okay. This is great. That is a perfect example of how you have an actual situation where something actually matters there. And there are far more. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a great example. And then um, the, the last one of their um, agenda is just like nationwide protection of voter rights. Sure. But here's the problem. That is also democratically coded. Yeah, it's coded. Yeah. So that's democratically if coded. Rights, voting rights. I mean, look, and here's the thing. You should blame Democrats for that one because they made voting rights into a code word. And that is just one of those that it's not coming back. So I would phrase it literally any other way. And I definitely wouldn't say, quote unquote, protect voting. There is like a general feeling. It's interesting. Like younger Democrats, like legitimately believe that it's like the Jim Crow South and that people cannot vote in huge swaths of the country. That's just not true. I mean, is it a little bit too hard in some states and counties? Yeah, no disagreement. But they like legitimately believe there's like a mass disenfranchisement of millions and millions of people. And it's literally not true. And this is, again, where like catastrophic rhetoric by Dems just does themselves zero favors. I mean, guys, Raphael Warnock is up by five fucking points in Georgia, okay? Despite their bullshit voting law. He almost certainly, I think personally, he's going to win um, bar, you know, what's happening right now. It's like, well, where it's this is why it doesn't help anything. And then they stay silent. Whenever it happens, I mean, there's an entire analysis, like a political analysis of the Georgia voting law that Republicans did try to make it harder to vote, but were so dumb in their execution that they actually didn't do so. And yet they responded to it as if it was the literal reenactment of the Jim Crow South. So catastrophic rhetoric doesn't fucking help anybody. And guess what? I'm I'm not saying that they uh, I'm not saying that the the, what is it? The impetus behind the law was, was good, but it's just like, they don't respond to reality. It doesn't help anything. And they've made this into a coded word. It's also just so annoying because the battle lines on this, like, for example, like voter ID, voter ID is super popular. It's also one of those culture war things where people get super incensed about. There's not a fucking shred of evidence that voter ID is a jack shit either way. Um, whenever it comes to, I've rossed out that great column on this, like two or three years ago. And it's like, yeah, it's very popular. It also doesn't do anything. Now, look, I mean, if you want to enact it, I don't really care. But I don't care either way. I think the arguments about it being racist or whatever are also bullshit. But that's exactly my point, which is that we get into these massive fights over things that don't matter whatsoever. So anyway, that's a voter ID has always been a major pet peeve of mine. And in general, it's just like voting rights. Yeah, just to put some, some more meat yeah. on that too, because what's so awkward here <laughs> is you basically have a... And I know both siderisms is, is like not is not great here in general, but here's part of the problem. And you and you you're you're like hinting at this. There are actually a bunch of Republicans who've been like caught on the record saying, like, oh yeah, yeah. like we are yeah. we are we are right. making it harder to vote so that we win more because we yeah. think that like minority voters, this, 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 or that. So from that incredibly bad faith starting point, folks see things like the voter ID laws the making it harder to making it more onerous to vote point. And they say things like, oh, wow, like basically we have this like deep, deep, deep crisis on our hands. And when you then have obviously Stacey Abrams saying that the election was stolen. And I think, I think the thing that's really difficult here is that like, there's plenty of like, I I did some like research on this when I was at PBS, there were plenty of sketchy things that happened in Georgia in, in, in 2018. Mm-hmm. So what my suggestion would basically just be, and my advice to people when they're looking at this issue is just like, just get really specific. So to your point, Sagar, like get very, like, once again, there's, there's a, there's a huge gap between the Jim Crow South, the new Jim Crow language and okay, that's interesting. 
the Georgia Secretary of State has made it more difficult to vote via closing precincts in certain parts of the state versus other parts of the state. So I just think the the really like to your point, Sagar, the catastrophist or just like the broad based narrative argument isn't helpful. And instead, I think this should be focused very much on like just like the specifics of like, wait, like, why are you closing those things? Oh, that's really interesting. The ones you're closing happen to be ones that are like majority black. This, 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 this and that. Because there's just like this real gap between like the aggressive narrative you're taking and the results on the ground. And then once you take the catastrophist argument and then Raphael Warnock wins, then Joe, John Ossoff wins, it's easier for someone in bad faith to say, what are you talking about? See, we weren't being bad when they were being incredibly bad faith. Like the, 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 the funny, and you're not saying this, but the funny take here is the Republican plan did not work. Is, is, is the is, is the actual mm. point people were playing and look, everyone plays games like that's politics they are playing games and it didn't work and when you take the catastrophist language and let them basically say see whoa john ossif won what do you mean that we're like trying to rig the thing it, it really makes it difficult here so just to sum up this sum up this segment uh i i basically think i'm in agreement with you on just like the point that so several several sum up points so number one Sure to most of these changes. Yeah. Sure to most of these changes. We've it's like once again at the gerrymandering stuff, it's very tough. Oh, wait, actually, let me just go back for a second because I want to I want to quote um from the from from Nick on the gerrymandering episode. Here's how here's how they should have described the nationwide protection of voting rights thing. He said his diagnosis for what's the matter with the political system right now is he wants to have a political system that is more responsive. Anything we do that increases the ability of people to vote and engage will force politicians to be more responsive per our thing. Right. That I think I think that is a less coded um mm-hmm. dem articulation of this. He thinks that politicians aren't responsive enough, they're not implementing the people's will, there's too much of a gap. I will support gerrymandering reform. This is him because anything that makes them have to actually be accountable to voters will help push us through the morass. The thing is, though, and this is the difference between Nick Seabrook and then the Andrew Yang thesis is he openly says, by the way, enacting gerrymandering will not solve, ending gerrymandering would not actually solve the political issue right now. Because at, at the end of the day, responsiveness is one like tiny part of that thesis. So yeah, just to sum up then, Look, I'm being honest with you guys. Like, if you are someone who thinks that like the biggest, most important issues are ranked choice voting, open primaries, pushing back on gerrymandering, and then voting rights protection, honestly, you're a Democrat. And the best thing you could do per history of third parties right now is you could prove there's a real constituency for these topics and get politicians nationwide to accept them. Yeah. Maybe that requires that the forward part. Actually, no, I, I don't want to just be like mean to people here. Go it, do it, like forward, do it, go no, for look, it. I wish them the best. I wish it would work. I just want them to do it the best way. Does that make yeah. sense? And yeah. it's like the, the here's the way. If 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 here's the way this if 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 oh, this is actually helpful. If they are right, here's how this will go down. Let's see the most optimistic scenario for them. Mm-hmm. Forward launches. It's revealed that they have figured out that there is just a unactivated part of the American political scene across all parties. That is really receptive to making the political system filled with more choices and also just more responsive. What will then happen is that will happen. They're not going to win any, they, they, they may win a big race or two. Maybe you'll get a governor to switch. Like once again, the Reform Party elected Jesse Ventura in the 1990s. Yep. So like that was the thing. You know, Ross Perot like had a really, really, really big run. So if that then happens, what will likely happen is the Democratic Party will adopt these changes. You might not like that, but that's the way this has basically worked here. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the real uh, third party. So we'll, we'll, do, we'll do more stuff on this, but there's always something there. Next and totally uh, unrelated topic, Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan or her prospective trip to Taiwan. So can you just introduce the topic and then give your perspective on it? So neutral sure. definition of what's happening and then give us your perspective. Nancy Pelosi, waning days as Speaker of the House, given a likely Republican route um, in November. She's probably going to either retire or whatever. Um, So she's spending her last days as Speaker of the House, kind of gallivanting around the world. She's been to the Pope, see the Pope for like the 90th time in Italy. Um, She's been traveling a lot on these congressional 
delegations. So she decided unilaterally that she wanted to visit Taiwan. The Speaker of the House has not visited Taiwan since 1997, kind of as a show of uh, democratic co- companionship in the middle of the invasion of Ukraine. Now, and you mean pro- democratic in terms of like small D, small like D democracies democratic. Yeah, threatened small by authoritarian D, Small machines. D democratic. Okay. So that's the kind of thing. However, it appears that she did not clear any of her travel or any of this with the president of the United States, which has led to an extremely awkward situation where President Biden was asked about this on the rope line. And he literally said, quote, it's not a good idea right now, which is essentially now ignited kind of a global crisis because the Chinese are intimating that they are literally going to pursue some sort of military action, not necessarily against no, they said, Taiwan. They said, they said, they said consequence, serious, severe consequences. Yeah. So they said serious. Okay. So I, I'm talking about reporting I've read so oh. far from the Intel community and more is that it actually could lead to, again, not necessarily in Taiwan, but it could lead to something in the South China Sea. Um, they are actually planning and very serious. It's very difficult to parse whether this is bullshit or not. They, the the U.S. intelligence community, of which I am suspect, but let's give them credit. They did get Ukraine correct. Who knows if their intel on China is anywhere as good? Personally, probably not, but I have no fucking idea. So I'm just telling you uh, what it is. They believe that China is very serious about undertaking some sort of actual military action. Now, that doesn't mean it's kinetic military action, which means that there's going to be bombs, stuff fired seizing some sort of islands, chains, flyovers. Um, There's like a dividing line in the Taiwan Strait, flying uh, jets over that. There's actually a fear currently in the US intel community that they could actually intercept Nancy Pelosi's plane, which of course would ignite a... So again, that's military action, but that's not necessarily like shooting down something and force it to land somewhere that's not Taiwan. All of this would be very bad. So now we're in a real pickle because the Biden administration openly, the president of the United States, the executive, the uh, uh, duly elected commander in chief and the person solely responsible for U.S. foreign policy is like, I don't want you to go. Uh, She did not clear her trip. But now here's the issue. China's like, hey, you can't go. So now the administration is basically stuck in a place where they say they're like, well, yeah, we don't really want her to go. But now if she doesn't go, it looks like she's caving to China. So it's a real it's a real problem. And Beyond what I actually think, can I say one thing real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but you just said solely responsible for U.S. foreign policy. This is where this gets very complicated, right? Because I I, I want to like pull on this, right? And this is the difficult point: co-equal branches of government. Like it's kind of funny. Like a lot of Mm -hmm. listeners here. This and this is such a fascinating issue because it kind of gets at like actual tensions in our political system. So, guys, remember, the founding fathers did not embrace political parties they had to but they like when they were when they're making the constitution they were not like yeah i love political parties like that's the system they were anti-factional so technically speaking as speaker of the house even though nancy pelosi is a democrat even though she supports 99.999 percent of president biden's agenda even though she sees herself as tied together with the with with the executive branch in the democratic party actually she doesn't know president biden anything Mm -hmm. like from Mm -hmm. a constitutional perspective yeah she's speaker of the house she's a co-equal branch of government so the president has a lot of control in terms of the actual duties of the executive branch the president as head of state has much more unilateral influence responsibility control over foreign policy but technically speaking nancy pelosi could say that's all true i still can go because I am head of Congress and so you don't control says, me. She can do whatever she wants. And now is it well advised? And I think this is why it really mm-hmm. pisses me off. This is not part of a broader strategy. Like I said, look, if this was Boehner, then what is there to say? They're of different parties. He could do whatever he wants. As we literally saw in 2015, by the way, I still think this is an outrageous act. They invited Benjamin Netanyahu to speak against the Iran deal in the US Congress while Barack Obama, the president of the United States, was advocating for the Iran deal. Once again, Congress can do what it wants and so can Bibi. Guess what? It was still a fucking stupid move. And actually, it's one of those things that pushed um, that pushed Israel politics and made it way less bipartisan because it was such a slap in the face to the president of the United States who was sitting at that time. This is the issue, which is that Nancy Pelosi, if she actually, you know, this is the thing about strategy. 
this is not like a well planned out trip. Personally, I think this is about narcissism, which is that Pelosi really enjoys getting greeted as a quasi head of state whenever she travels abroad in her military plane. And she just wants to go over there to quote unquote, get good press and make a splash and kind of paint her forward and end her legacy as an 80 something year old woman and kind of outstripping the administration. But guess who has to clean that shit up? It's the administration. And if the US military and the president of the United States who listens to their advice and ultimately determines foreign policy on our behalf, and also the commander in chief is like, I don't want you to go. Again, this is not a legal matter. I'm saying how she should have behaved herself was she should have called up President Biden and said, hey, I want to go to Taiwan. And he should have said, all right, let me check with General Milley and the intel community and let me get back to you. And then he should call back and say, yeah, you know, Nancy, can you do me a solid? It's really not a good idea right now. I'm bogged down in fucking Ukraine. I've got all this other shit going on, Chips Act, et cetera. I just don't think this is the right move. China, by the way, you know, what's very interesting too is this is not a good time for this trip because yeah. right now there's planning going on ahead of the party Congress where Xi Jinping is about to get nominated for historic third term. Second, China maybe has a for, lot maybe, of- Maybe for life. This is the key probably thing. It's not just life. It, it's not yeah. just that he, and this is, and dude, this is explicitly yeah. the Biden administration's argument. Yes. They're like, yeah. they have not specifically said you could never go to Taiwan. They've said we are in this four month lead up to Xi Jinping's ascension to his third term. Um, post Mao, Chinese leaders have not served for more than two terms. So he made the reform that he could go again. And technically speaking, this could signify his transition to like a paramount leader for life. So this is a well, it will. huge, yeah. yeah, it will. This is well, a this huge, is, yeah, yeah. This, this is, is a huge very, period. Key time. So the Biden administration's <laughs> argument is of all. So it's not even just about Ukraine, right? Even if the Ukraine war was not happening, they would probably say, "Hey, this is just not it." Right. Challenging Xi to his face when he needs to really solidify. Once again, China's going through a lot of struggles. There's debate over the zero COVID policy. Their economy isn't doing well. There's all the like. There's a serious debate. Like, there's actual debate in the in the in the um, like in the CCP right now, as far as we could tell, about like, hey, like, did we go too far in placing ourselves behind Russia when the mm -hmm. war started? Uh, because there's been like back channels that they aren't happy if Russia's once again controversial, but like they have not been like basically Putin assured the Chinese this would be easier than it was. And there's controversy about this. So like the last thing you need to add to that mix of three is, oh, by the way, she. Oh, and then we're, we're, like we're gonna we're gonna push you. And then one other quick thing here. And the Biden administration people talked. I did a, I did a hit with Josh Rogan for breaking mm -hmm. points that will probably come up by the time this episode is out. The Chinese apparently. And this seems difficult to understand, but it may be true. Just refuse, maybe because they want to provoke an audience, and this is bad faith. That like Joe Biden, and Nancy, Joe Biden has zero control over Nancy Pelosi. Oh yeah, well this this we've gotten to this before, and I actually do think there's a lot to this. They just don't understand co-equal branch of government. Period. They're like, you're the Democrat, and the same part. I think with Boehner, they would probably get it, but they would still think it's weird. Newt, went, this, when, Newt went. Newt went when put President Clinton right. was was in power. Yeah. So I think I think they would probably get that. They'd be like, yeah, you know, they're against each other, but they're like, you're the same party. They're like, I don't believe that this is not a. And here's the thing. I mean, I kind of get it from their perspective. They're complete authoritarians. Like they and they're not Western at all. They think this is bullshit. They're like, for example, there's that story about the uh, 2000. Eight when Hu Jintao visited the White House and there was a protester who interrupted him and the Chinese government they were like you planted him and Bush was like it's a free country and and who they were like no they're like you did it they're like you planted this and it's because in China that would never happen because that it would be, would be it would killed be, and it would yeah. and if it, and did it would happen, be planned yeah, yeah it would have been, it would have been planned <laughs> yeah it's like when the Obama once landed at Air Force One, and they're like, oh, the staircase is gone. There's like no red carpet. You have to use this. And they're like, this is bullshit. You obviously have a staircase that can fit Air Force One. It made him humiliated because he had to exit from like the back stairs. Anyway, over there, all this bullshit is planned. Here, it's actually just not, but they refuse to understand that. So yeah, I think Josh is correct, which is that given their understanding of a American politics, or given their understanding and heuristic of politics, which is all that matters whenever you're talking about your adversary, the zero COVID thing you just talked about is also very important, which is that China is in some serious domestic turmoil. Uh, we may not see it, 
but it's bubbling underneath the surface. I don't know if you've seen this, but their housing market is collapsing. They're having literal riots in the streets about mortgages. They have massive financial turmoil. The Chinese middle class dream is actually really dying right now as a result of zero COVID, uh, inflation, energy blackouts, coal problems. She has to show his population he's in charge. And just like here in America, whenever the president gets involved in like a foreign struggle and is standing up, even if you have domestic problems, it can be very good for you. Just because China doesn't have elections doesn't mean it doesn't have domestic politics. Their only thing that they care about is holding on to power. So, yeah, I mean, I think the Biden administration is correct. And I think Pelosi has really fucked us by putting us in a really bad position. Personally, I think that she's probably not going to go at this point, but that's also a bad look because it makes it seem that they got to veto it. So she should never have put us in this position in the first place. And this is why I just believe that when you're dealing with nuclear powers, you need extremely clear and concise communication and information that I've always hated the way that Biden would say, yeah, we're going to defend Taiwan. And then the white house would come out and say, oh, well, actually strategic ambiguity is the policy. It's like, no, they're neat. It's, no, like every single time that that happens, you are dramatically undermining the U.S. position. It's like when uh, Biden said, by God, this man cannot remain in power with Putin. And it's like, well, what is the policy? Is it regime change or is it not regime change? Because, look, if you're Russia, you're like, hey, I'm an autocratic country. The president is the quote unquote. That's their understanding, like the autocrat. Like he says is the policy. I don't fucking care what the State Department Anthony Blinken puts out in a statement. The Chinese are the same way. And so, yeah, and I also we think I don't think we should also underestimate this. You know, Xi, for all of his bellicosity and that, he is the middle ground of the CCP. People forget this. There are actual people in the CCP, just as there are also on the other side, people who want peace and they want to be a lot more westernized. There are actual warmongers who would scare the shit out of you, just like our – think about our most bloodthirsty neocons in American politics. Those people also exist in China. And something like this gives them a huge amount of ammunition in the CCP and more at a time when they can actually extract the maximal amount of concessions from Xi Jinping because he needs them in order to assume his third party power for life. Just because you could become power for life in China, you people who I think people don't understand this system of government because we haven't just seen it on the superpower stage since the time of the Soviet Union. There is just because, like I said, there's no democracy doesn't mean that quote unquote politics doesn't exist. And this is a lot of what Politburo politics looks like in the days of the Soviet Union. So it's it's a problem, Marshall. That's interesting yeah. what Josh said, though. It totally makes sense. I, it intuitively actually makes sense to me is that they will never believe that this isn't a plan by the Biden minister. They will never believe it. Yeah. And it's kind of funny. Even the uh, even the Biden's awkward comment on the tarmac. Yeah. You could say like, that was planted. That was he. He obviously like, right, said right, that right. so that yeah. like you could increase ambiguity. So a couple, couple, couple of things here um, to put like a an added layer here too. Like when you talked about how this was like a bad look, um, I want to really emphasize this isn't just like about like once again like vibes or perception or messaging. If Nancy Pelosi backs down from this, this is why I actually don't quite know what to do. My take is basically that Nancy needs to not do this trip, but then she needs to show up at some point. As speaker still, oh, this is Josh. Like no, 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 no. Well, she's a speaker. Josh's position uh, is basically what he thinks is going to happen, and she's going to call it off and then show up in December oh, as okay. part of her valedictory tour. Uh, when is the when is the vote? It's in November. She? So, like, oh, it would be good. it, it yeah, would be uh, so because here's the here's the key point, everyone. Now that this can of now that Pandora's box has been opened, if she backs, if we if she backs down from this trip, the obvious lesson for the CCP would be. Wait a second, we could draw red lines mm -hmm. basically wherever we want. And Josh's point is right now, it's this stupid trip that was not necessary. It didn't matter, but that will basically just escalate from there. Next, it's going to be, well, members of Congress can't even go because members of Congress were just in Taiwan mm -hmm. a few months ago. And next, it's going to be, well, you know, we noticed that, you know, U.S. troops were, you know, in Taiwan offering yeah, the special we have forces US training. Advisors, that right. is our line there, too. Well, we've noted this, 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 and that could basically just escalate. So what basically needs to happen here is this a trip needs to happen, but it needs to be timed properly. And I just want to really just like go deeper on like the strategy thing you pointed out here, which is, once again, I 
am operationally like the center left hawk of this podcast, but what's been my position so difficult is just deep frustration with the Biden administration's just inability to do the thing that at the start of the first Cold War was so important. You know, like there were all sorts of critiques of Harry Truman, post Korean War, all those different bits. But what he and his administration, like Dean Acheson, Secretary of State, um, George C. Marshall, um, even though know, even like Winston Churchill and like his, you know, um, Iron Curtain speech in Missouri, what they did so effectively was they just like set the rules of George Kennan, you know, um, mm-hmm. um, X and, you know, the, the, the Cold War containment strategy. They just like set the rules of the game in a way that was bipartisanly implementable for the duration of the Cold War. And now that we're clearly in a second Cold War um, with Russia and China, now we could debate how we got here. We could debate what the specific response to both of these countries are. There's debate to be had about Ukraine. There's debate to be had about Taiwan. The Russian and Chinese conceive of themselves like in this situation. So no matter what, like this is the situation. We are in a Cold War where there are direct like military tensions on both ends. The key task for the Biden administration and what they should be doing as technocratic center-left Democrats are saying, hey, here is what our policy should be when it comes to unity of government. For example, during the Cold War, this never would have happened. Yeah, never. Nah, because right. they would have said, listen, Speaker, Speaker Rayburn, we know that you are part of our party and we're all together and you could te- and you could you could do whatever you want. But like, let's get real. Nuclear war is at risk here. A hot war is at risk here. We have to coordinate. Tip now, O'Neill never would have done this to Ronald Reagan. That's the, you know, yeah. and he was a different party. So like, there you go. I think that's a perfect example. Speaker Gingrich, Tip let's, 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 make, let's make, you know, Speaker, let's like have Gingrich be speaker in the 90, 80s. He wouldn't have done that because there just was like mm-hmm. a baseline set of rules. And that is just what I'm just not seeing from the Biden folks. And I, I, I genuinely just don't understand why this isn't happening because this, it's, it's not, it, it's not that like the specific, like, and once again, like it wasn't as if the, you know, Truman people woke up in 1947 and just perfectly laid everything out. Like, that's the way we teach AP US history, but it actually like evolves over time. You make a decision to uh, support the Greeks and the Turks. You make a decision to actually go into Korea. You make a decision not to go into Jian Ben Fu and protect the French in Indochina. Those are what that, that policy actually looks like. But I'm just not even seeing them start the project. And it has to be in a very explicit project. You know, like Winston Churchill giving his Iron Curtain speech, that's an implicit, and he's British, but that's an implicit part of the project. The the X, you know, the, the containment letter, that is an explicit part of the project. So what the, the key thing that Biden needs to do, and any Republican needs to do, anyone needs to do this, like this is up for the taking is, okay, there's this Cold War, we're in it, there's going to be all sorts of debate, right? So there's a debate over whether we joined NATO back in the Mm -hmm. 50s. There was a debate over whether or not we protect the French empire in Indochina or whether we don't. There's a debate about whether or not you invade Cuba. Debate's always going to happen. That's going to be very like the right will have a response, the left will have a response. You had rollback versus detente in, you know, in, 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 in the, in the 1970s, but there were still rules of the road. And it seems to me that a nonpartisan rule of the road is co-equal branches of government have to coordinate. Now, it doesn't mean that the executive branch always wins, right? Like there's a word where Nancy is like, listen, Nancy, my car, first name basis. There's a word where Nancy Pelosi is like, listen, I'm going. But what Biden should be doing in that situation is, okay, then let's coordinate the yeah. perfect time right. for you to go. Let's talk to the Intel community because to your point about trusting the Intel community or not, this is the space where the Intel community can be trusted. Because once again, it's basically Oh, how big of a risk is there? What are the Chinese saying? I mean, to me, it would just be like, yeah, I would just be like, so what are they saying? Like, what is G's email? You know, like, what's the minutes from the latest fucking situation room meeting? Okay, that's interesting. And the take is, and this is what the Intel community, the Intel community is not saying they are going to send four J-20 Mm. jets to perfectly, they're, they're saying, oh, they are taking this very, 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 very seriously. There's a lot of risk here. We should really assess whether or not this risk right now is worth it. 
So that's yep. a that's a key thing on that topic. So, so next topic is we're getting to our last two or three um, semiconductors. We've talked a lot about semiconductors. We're going to talk more about semiconductors. A guy named Chris Miller has a really cool book coming out October 4th on semiconductors. We're definitely going to have him on the show. We'd love to talk about that. But sorry, introduce the CHIPS Act, the semiconductor bill, which just passed through and what some of the controversy was. Yeah, a really interesting bill uh, just passed uh, actually both houses of Congress. President Biden's going to sign it into law probably today. $52 billion for semiconductor manufacturing here in the United States, $250 billion, I believe, and with the additional money going to National Science Foundation grants that put pump money into research around semiconductors at the academic level. So Really interesting. 64 people voted for it in the U.S. Senate, uh, mostly Republicans and then one Democrat voting against it. 20 Republicans voted for it in the House of Representatives. The bill itself, the controversy is actually pretty simple, which is that uh, there were three separate types of objections to the bill, ironically, two of which are kind of a horseshoe one. So Bernie Sanders finding himself in the same camp as like a Rand Paul and others who are against quote unquote corporate welfare. And then uh, Tom Cotton, Marco Rubio, and a few others voting against the bill because they didn't think there were stringent enough protections in the bill against the money being able to funnel production in China. So that's actually a fair concern. I'm going to put that here. I think the corporate welfare one is especially stupid. So Bernie Sanders' argument was that Intel and others have had record amounts of profit. And that's why we shouldn't give them any money. Well, look, do you know why they're profitable? That's actually the problem. Intel bought back its own stock. And Intel also became profitable because we design all of the chips here in the United States, and then we manufacture them in Taiwan or in Asia. 92%, 92% come from Taiwan. Bingo. So, okay. Um, well, and this is people were making fun of me for this because I said, look, we live in a free market capitalist country. And they're like, yeah, but then why do you need corporate welfare? The point I'm making is you just can't force Intel to just build shit here. You just can't. It doesn't work that way. I mean, in well, a certain I mean, sense, technically, you could. but right now, like, let's get, this is helpful. I'm sure you could pass some like defense procurement act, this, this, Even or that. Then, it would be, but, but, it would but, be hard. And then it would get embroiled in the fucking legal system. And it would exactly. Take there's, years, there's, right? there's, no, there's no consensus for that. That's you know what's thing. easier? Let's just pay them. And we, that's, that's actually why the money makes sense. Because what we're doing is we're saying, okay, I understand the market conditions under which this made it possible. That has made the United States less, uh, less, it has made the United States a lot less safe and more vulnerable to a major economic shock in the event of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Thus, we are going to appropriate $52 billion to use only on production of chips here in the United States, which supports uh, mil- hundreds of thousands of jobs, b- untold billions amount of unlocked GDP, and on top of that, national security. Doesn't seem that bad to me. $52 billion. So again, is it corporate welfare? Yeah, but guess what? Sometimes corporate welfare is fine. I mean, for example, and I, look, I mean, I'm not a politician, so I can just say this. For example, the airlines. The, we bailed out the airlines to the tune of $50 billion. Now, obviously, we didn't do that great of a job for it, and I certainly would use all of our lessons learned um, in the next airline bailout if that came, just like, by the way, that we used lessons learned from the 2001 airline bailout post 9-11 whenever we were doing it in 2020. You live and you learn. But that doesn't mean I'm, I'm never going to bail out the airlines again because we need air travel in the United States. Like, it's it. what are we supposed to do? Just let them completely die. These are massively strategically important industries. So 50 billion. Yeah. That's actually not that much money at all. That's one six. No, maybe one eighth of the overall Pentagon budget for the year that is going towards just chip manufacturing, which frankly, more than the defense budget is going to probably keep the country more safe than all of that 800 billion that you spend in the Pentagon uh, HR budget. So it really annoyed the shit out of me that Sanders was doing this. He also had a key part of his speech where he's like, the justification for doing this is because uh, other countries subsidize their chip industry. Well, by that uh, logic, Mr. Speaker, we should have universal health care. And so I'm like, are you saying that you're never going to vote for anything that's good for America until we have universal health care? Because that's, that's fucking stupid. It's like, what is that even supposed to mean? So you're just you're going to vote for every, for, against everything ever until this. So it's been really amusing to me to watch Robert Reich and Bernie become like uh, Cato libertarians. They're like, well, uh, they're in profits. 
Um, I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm not saying he's good. Intel is a bad actor. They spent a lot of their money on stock buybacks. Um, guess what? It still takes 10 years to build a fab. It takes years in order to build chips. Intel is the one we got right now. You fight with the people that you have, not with what you wish that you have. It's not a perfect situation, but do you want the US economy to collapse overnight because you know, of a war in the Taiwan Strait? Because that actually could happen. Like we literally all, the entire US economy, one sixth or something of the US economic production could be cut off in a single day. Like, okay, that seems way worse than 52 billion. Now on the China side, the Republican objections, I think these are fair, which is that the bill was shoddily put together. It gives too much discretion to the Commerce Department. It basically allows Gina Raimondo and other China doves in order to redefine rules around production, which would enable uh, Intel and others to play games. I think that's a fair objection to the bill. But again, we have the Senate that we have. We have the House that we have. There is no perfect piece of legislation. Does that ultimately rise to the level of where I'm going to vote against $52 billion towards US chips? And also, if Donald Trump wins the presidency, then I don't think a lot of these problems happen. And that could happen in two years. And this is like a 10 year funding project. So, yeah, I think this is a great piece of legislation. And I think it's good to show people we can do these things. I'm supportive of industrial policy. I think $52 billion is not, frankly, I think it should be way more, but I'm going to take whatever I can get. Yeah, no. Uh- Double click on everything you said. Yeah. A couple, couple, couple top line things here. Like, so one, I like how you said industrial policy because, like, to push back on Bernie, this isn't corporate welfare. This is industrial policy, right? This isn't like we did not wake up one day and say, you know what? Like, I just want like some dude right. who works at Intel to get more money because it's just vibes. Like, no, like we have a objective as a country, increasing our resiliency. In a dangerous world, we just did a whole segment right before this about how there could be a possible conflict in the, with like between China and Taiwan. A conflict between China and Taiwan would almost certainly bring the U.S. into it. It would bring the Japanese into it. It bring the British into it. It'd bring the Australians into it. Who knows where South Korea ends up there? But it's going to be big, and it's going to basically ruin everything. This is what Peter Zion is talking about with like the year 2019 really could have been the best year that we experienced from a pure like globalization perspective this century. So EOD, we have a situation where, and once again, I just want to really set the terms here because semiconductors are, you know, the New York Times did a great write-up on this. Just to give a quick definition, semiconductors are the tiny computer chips that are on everything from smartphones to satellites, missile defense systems, even your microwave or your washing machine. Just like everything is powered by these things. Like the whole, this is the new oil quote is a bit of a cliche, but like this is just desperately, desperately, desperately important to the way we actually live our lives. And as we saw during the pandemic, supply chain crunches, not even during a war, but just supply chain crunches really affected the economy. Obviously, there's a big debate about inflation, but that played a part of it. It's a, it's a part of the picture. So we're experiencing what this world looks like right now, where you see war interrupting the ability to trade and get access to different bits. You're seeing this in Ukraine now too, obviously. So in the face of that, it makes sense for the US to say, hey, maybe we don't have 92% of this critical good be dependent on a part of the world that at any moment could technically blow up, literally and figuratively. So to your point, I just really like the way you're putting this, where I think we just need to be more confident. Like $52 billion is worth that price. That's why the Bernie argument, I think, is just really... And he also said something that really, really annoyed me. And I think it just speaks to... I'm not a like, everyone needs to retire if you're old. But I think this gets to Bernie just like not really being met for this political moment. In his speech, he was talking about, he's like, I, you know, go, I'm not going to do the Bernie accent, which you are very, very good at. You're the accent guy here. But he's like, you know, I, I go around and meet everyday Americans. They are not talking about sunlight conductors. They're not talking about chips. So like that, this just isn't like a pressing need that Americans are feeling right now. The whole point of a vibe shift, the whole point of us embracing this new era and the whole point of the Biden administration pushing this bill, but also like not doing a good job of setting things up is... Americans might not care about it now, but they need to care about it, and they will care about it. I actually, I don't even. Now. I even disagree with Bernie's framing. I think people know. I think people I don't. Know I, I, would, I, would, I would. I would. I would. I would. I would. I would. Be, I would bet money that, like, if we went to a Vermont diner, a lot of voters 
per because he was saying he's saying they're talking about inflation. They're talking yeah, about what do you think causes inflation? Why do you think used cars are so expensive? But fair, but my, my point, my you're treating it analytically. I am sure. just saying that, like technically speaking, what he's saying is technically sure. correct. Right. Yeah. And what's so frustrating is guess what, dude? A lot of voters would have said they cared about supply chains circa 2018. Right. Yeah. But one of the reasons, you know, a friend of the show, we're going to have him on again to talk about this soon, is like Matt Stoller. Matt Stoller, despite his Matt Stolleriness, wrote about supply change in 2011, 2012. This is a vulnerability issue that is going to affect us someday. We need politicians and we need people who could actually say, hey, I know this thing is the top of the headline, but this is a really structural, fundamental thing that we're going to focus our energy and attention on. So Bernie basically saying that, one, and once again, he's giving a speech, he's being rhetorical. I know he's not being literal, but him even being comfortable basically saying that in the face of the challenges we face right now, we are literally going to only like frame things in the means of like, well, what is the literal everyday voter thing you had? It's just like really pathetic, honestly. Yeah. And I like understand. Bernie, you don't want to advance that metric because like, let's get real for a second. Let's apply that logic to healthcare or you no, know, let's apply that logic to climate change, mm -hmm. right? Like I'm a serious climate action person. Come on, man. Like the note, like if you go to that same diner and actually push people, on the climate issue. So not just like the, like the poll that says it's supportive, right. you know, like my dad and I are doing an episode on this. If you actually just see climate change just also does not come out in favor of those polls too. Now I think actually we should, should be taking on climate change, but not because like voters are telling because it's something that's really important. And this really just gets to like the core issue here that we've increasingly focused on in this podcast where like Andrew Yang thinks like the central pivot point of like the current political vibe is like voter choice. I think you and I agree. The central pivot point is that the country is basically just not resilient enough for the level of craziness that we're going to reach at a domestic and geopolitical level um, over the next decade. And it's not yep. just the US, it's, it's, it's Europe too. All the Europeans reactivating the nuclear, their nuclear plants, passing bills to make themselves less dependent on Russia. Like all of this process is basically us saying like, oh, wow, like we got a wake up call during COVID. We didn't do enough at any level. What does it look like for eight to 10 years to basically fix that? And it's gonna be really tough. It's gonna be really shitty and it's gonna require us to spend money, but it's also gonna require us to not basically get caught up in preset narratives about like corporate welfare. And look, like once again, this is why I like your point about the Republican saying like, but wait, like if you actually look at the bill, it means that they could actually spend a bunch of money not even reshoring things. Great. That is the debate and the conversation we should be having. That is the actual issue. Because once again, the only actual number here that matters for me is 92% of our essential semiconductors come from a place where there could be a major conflict and a major war. And also, by the way, like, as we're seeing during the the war with Russia and Ukraine, a huge issue here is product production, industrial capacity. Um, if there's a conflict with China in the Asia Pacific, if we need to back the Taiwanese, or even we, or even if we want to just make sure the Taiwanese have the ability to defend themselves, right? Like you have people like Bridge Colby talking about turning Taiwan into a porcupine that is just not worth attacking. That requires that there be semiconductors and chips to have in these missiles, to have in these We had this big problem with Javelins, actually, already. Yeah, javelins yeah talk require, about this. Javelin missiles require an, a huge amount of semiconductors. We have a huge shortage right now of Javelin missiles and uh, because we're sending them all to Ukraine. But now the US military, the production capacity isn't really there. So yeah, actually, even if, if, if China invaded Taiwan right now, we wouldn't have enough Javelins to send to Taiwan and yeah. to Ukraine. And luckily- uh, it's situation- yeah. And it's, and it's just sort of like, that's the, that's the real disaster area here. So yeah, once again, the next decade is going to be crazy and we need politicians who can be tactical, AKA focusing on the line. Like our Republican staff or friends were like giving us a good critique of like, no, but look, like we think it's important the U.S. be more resilient. Resiliency doesn't equal them building more fabs mm -hmm. in endangered places. Let's actually focus here. That tactical critique is different than a head in the sand Oh, like this is just like corporate welfare. We reduce it to that. Yeah. Um, last topic here, um, Brittany Griner. Um, is it Griner? Is it? I don't know. I this think is. So. I'm I'm so bad with last names. I have the urge to like make everything complicated. So my my head is telling me no, it's Brittany Brittany Grenier. Just like whatever. So I'm not saying whatever to her to her plight and her struggle. I'm just saying uh, apologies if I got it wrong. I watched a CBS YouTube show uh, before this episode to make sure I got it right. 
host called it Brittany Griner. This is on her if she gets it wrong. And then never I get it wrong. So yeah, so there is talk that a deal, she's obviously the WNBA, um, US Olympian um, star who played in Russia. Um, obviously, there's a lot of controversy, like why was she in Russia? It's because, and once again, I'm not alleging that the WNBA is a conspiracy, but you know, if you're a female athlete in this country, the WA is not particularly profitable as a league. So your salary is garbage compared to a comparable Olympian in the NBA. So what often they will do and lower level, what's unique about this is like top tier WNBA athletes go to foreign leagues. Typically yeah, like in American sports, time. typically right. in American sports league, it's like mediocre or has been men who will do it. But no, like she's a WNBA star. She is a Olympian and she's going to this league. She did it to make more money. Cause once again, making some 200 K like is, is, is once again, not great. Um, and it's complicated, but it's not great. So she is in Russia right, uh, before the Ukraine war starts and she is grabbed before the war starts, uh, essentially, under the argument, well, yeah, dur- 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 as the war starting, essentially under the argument that she was caught with um, cannabis infused. What were they? They were. It's unclear. She either had CBD or she had a vape pen. She either had CBD in it or THC. It's actually not clear which one of those it is. It's clearly a pretext that they're holding her. So anyway. Yeah. And she's, so she, so she, she's a, she's a political prisoner. Um, because like once again, there's a, what's been really frustrating about this experience is that oh, and, and look, this is why this is controversial. Um, so the Biden administration put out officially that they were exploring a deal for her and a diplomat, um, Mr. Whalen, um, where they would exchange him, them for a Russian arms dealer who the Russians have wanted for a long time. This is made more complicated by the fact that during the um, George Floyd moment, um, Brittany was talking about like not playing the national anthem um, before games um, as part of like BOM stuff. And I think those factors, so like the worth of the Russian exchangey and then also like the culture war aspect of this has caused a lot of people, I think, frankly, to just be really, really, really cruel. Um, like obviously we're at a point in our society where especially in center left spaces, everyone's everyone has adopted the position that Michael Jordan saying Republicans buy sneakers too was not either naive or just not sustainable in a hyperpolarized moment. So athletes basically saying, like, I don't want to talk about politics. Um, so a lot of people are basically saying, you know, like athletes should have voices, they should talk, they should discuss. And and basically I I'm of that opinion. Um, not just like free speech, but just sort of, yeah, like people should say their opinions. Um, what's also kind of funny because of the changing market dynamics, like actually it's probably better for you to polarize, um, your brand and yourself. It's probably not possible to sell to like a broad American middle anymore. It's not the eighties. It's not the nineties, but I do think though, that it is entirely reasonable to grade athletes then on a curve, but I'm sorry, but like, and also by the way, this is different than with LeBron. Because here's the thing about LeBron. LeBron is speaking, and LeBron is saying Daryl needs to shut the f up about China stuff while he's trying to sell billions of dollars worth of shoes. LeBron is very considerably has direct business interest in the geopolitical situation, and he's using his bill his power to push back against other people's speech. So LeBron is an entirely different category, but honestly. If a not random because she's an Olympian, but if, if if an American athlete says an opinion about the national anthem, I just think it's cruel. And like, let's just get real for a second. Like, I do not. Part of the problem that's revealed itself with like poli- with 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 athletes getting aggressive about politics, I think we're just quickly discovering that like, let's get real. Like, because the previously politicized athletes were, you know, um, Muhammad Ali, um, Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Very, very, very well read. Very, very, you could disagree with them, but very, very, very sophisticated analysts of the space. I think we've forgotten the fact that a lot of these people just do not have particularly sophisticated political views or particularly like defensible um, frameworks that they could like eloquently and perfectly articulate. So, yeah, I am, I'm not going to just be, be, be very cruel and say, like, you know what, like, F around, find out. This is what happens. Like, it's not worth taking this risk. 
I'm not mad at Brittany Griner, but I think that the narrative around the idea that we didn't do everything possible to free her, that people didn't care because they're racist is ridiculous. I and, agree with that. And, yeah. I, and that's what pisses me off more than anything. Yeah. Um, guess what? She's just not that famous. People don't give a shit about the WNBA. You could say whatever you want about that. I don't think that I don't think it's a broader wait, 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 commentary. Go wait, ahead. Push back on that. What? But dude, like she's been in the news since the start. So like, no, 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 no. Before the, 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 okay. the, the contention is okay, that, yeah, 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 yeah. Just the contention cool. is that Brittany Griner is that it was not being freed because people didn't care because she was in the WNBA. That's the contention. Yeah. There is some truth to that before all this happened, but the moment she was seized, it was in the press. And then it became frankly, almost political blackmail against the White House to say, you need to do everything in your power to special attention. Also, here's my contention. I think that the woke freak out here in the US is going to dramatically come back to bite these people in the ass. A very interesting uh, lesson that I learned from the Jimmy Carter book is that by elevating the Iranian hostages to such political heights in Washington and by making it so tied to uh, a broader media thing, the Iranians became more intransigent and did not want to release these political prisoners because they understood that keeping it in the news was politically powerful and increased their bargaining power. There's no guarantee right now that the Russians are going to release Brittany Griner. They, they are smart. They know that she's become a cultural flashpoint here in America. Why not keep her? And just for another year or so and let the, you know, and let people just continue to ratchet up the cultural conversation here in America. It actually probably would have been better off because I personally think that the administration was going to come to this point for a swap, no matter what, as far as a swap. Yeah, I support it. I mean, I mean, Victor Boot is a piece of shit. He is He's the Russian arms biggest dealer. arms dealers in the face of the planet, responsible for a lot of crimes. And yeah, it sucks to have to give him up. But I actually read a good quote, which is, that's just what we do. Uh, we give people up no matter how much they're worth for our own citizens. It's like when Israel, what did they release? Like a thousand Hamas soldiers for one IDS. He was like a private or something like that too. But it's like, yeah, that's just how it goes. Like, that's what we do. Um, and that's a policy that, um, you know, look, it's, you don't go real politic whenever you're talking about your own citizens. So anyway, let uh, me, let me add something yeah, to that too, ahead. because the, 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 the critical thing here is, so my beef is not with Griner. Yeah. It's with all of her, her woke army. Yeah. Well, it's not even her army. Cause she's like, literally, that's, that's what's like <laughs> sure. so crappy here. Like she's like stuck in a, a Russian jail, a country, which is like both racist and like, and the term homophobia gets thrown around. It's like legitimately, like, I do not think she is safe. Um, mm -hmm. in, in, in Russia um, at this moment. So look, here's here's my here's my sum up. My basic position is actually I'll tell this story. I once missed a flight. Um, I was like 2013. I was actually visiting you in DC. Mm -hmm. I missed my flight because I got on the wrong train and just missed it. And I was like freaking out. I'd never missed a flight before. I called my dad and he was like, calm down. It's okay. Everyone gets one. Everyone is going to like miss a flight. And he like booked me a new flight. He got me a hotel in Alexandria. Just no questions asked. We'd never talk about it like ever again. Mm -hmm. I think that is how we should approach this question of Americans in Russia post war in Ukraine. Moving forward, we need to treat, I, frankly, I think Russia and China the way we treat North Korea in the sense that if someone gets seized in North Korea, it's not the Britney Griner yeah, it's situation. Right, it's right, like, right. whoa, yeah, we've what are you literally doing? been in at war with them effectively since the 1950s. Right. You know they're crazy. You know, like look at look at Otto, right? You know they're bad faith. You know that they're they're wackadoodle. What were you doing? Like we, 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 we want to negotiate for you. We're gonna to try to help. It's like you. those Iran Iraq hikers. I'm like, yeah, yeah, dude, you went hiking in fucking Iran. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, and, and guess what? Like we we will negotiate, and we for still you, got them out. Actually, but yeah. there is a but there is a certain presumption of like what were you doing? Now, genuinely speaking, and a like what was she doing? Like even like, and she said like you know the 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 CBD or whatever it was was like prescribed. It's like here's the deal from now on. One, I don't think any American citizen considering geopolitics over the next several years, should go anywhere within 
a thousand miles of Russia. Um, no American citizen, especially someone who's prominent. Um, no, you should be very, very, very cautious about going to China, um, right now too, considering the situation we're in. Um, the Canadians are running into a lot of problems with this. It's just like very, very, very dangerous. And if you are going to go, you basically should be bring a change of clothes and like, that's it. Like, no, like don't even bring like a vape. So like, what's it like? Don't, don't bring your, just nothing. So because that is a situation moving forward, I think we have to be very merciful towards people who got caught, who got caught during that shift change. Um, Brittany traveled to Russia during the lead up to the war. I think it was a terrible idea to go in general. Ever since the, the second you're talking, people were talking about the war starting in December, should not have gone. But like, I understand, I understand what happened there. Moving forward. This is now a Iran North Korea equivalent where it's just too dangerous um, to go and people should understand the risks they are undertaking. Um, and I think frankly, if we're debating the the ability to exchange for the Russian arms dealer, anyone who enters Russia moving forward in this similar situation, that would almost certainly have to play into the debate about what is worth exchanging in that situation. Not do we seek to exchange, but like what price are you what what yeah, price are you expecting right. willing to pay? So it's really, guys, do like I've 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 I have accorded myself um with the knowledge that I will never go to Russia and I'm probably never gonna ever go to yeah, China. Yeah, I'm very sad about that too. I you've uh, been you, 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 went, you went in high school, but I, yeah, yeah, it was 2008. It was, but I'm it was saying that's cool. That, that that was peak. The, the post cool, post man. post Olympics, like that was it great. makes me sad. I I really China is such a beautiful country, the Great Wall of China and all that. It's incredible. It makes me sad. I'll never get to see it. I always wanted to see Russia. I wanted to see Tsar Castello, the palace. It's like the Versailles of uh, the Tsars. I always wanted to see Stalingrad and all of that. But yeah, no, I'm I'm the same boat. I just the moment it happened, I was like, wow, I'm never gonna get to go to hey, Russia. You mean you mean, Vol- you mean you mean you mean Volgograd. Oh Volgograd, right? Yeah, which is, is, <laughs> is that what they still call it? They changed it. They that. changed it after oh, I know they uh, changed it then, but I'm I wonder if they changed it again. I, oh Whatever, you're oh matter. yeah like yeah. <laughs> whole other topic. Um wow okay this was a stem winder but we are replenished by all right not having any episodes. Guys this has been really 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 great. Um if you have listened I heard this on a podcast, and this is actually the best way to pitch this. If you are still listening to the show at this point, you are in our most intensive parts mm-hmm. of the listenership. So I'm going to presuppose that if you have not supported us already, you really should support us because you clearly get value from this show and this conversation. This is supported by Supercast. This is supported by our expanded content. We have our Q&A portions, commentary, all those great things. Would love to bring you all into the conversation and do things like that. Um, we got a comment on Supercast, our AMA page, where someone says we need to find a way to bring more video in, maybe like actually publishing like the Q&A video as we do it for subscribers, all those different bits. That is supported by you. So once again, if you go to realignment supercast.com would really appreciate it and thank you for joining us on the new season of the realignment let us know what we should talk about in the show notes in the comments all those great things see you all next time see ya